Hey, welcome back. It's uh, Painting Trafalgar, and this is episode five. Are they called episodes? I don't know. But this is the painting that I started in the other episode. This is the one where you're watching it from the beginning. And so you'll remember that I was working from photographs of models that I had arranged over a fabric uh, background. And then the models were arranged in such a way that they would provide this depth where there's like, there's two back here that are almost out of focus and overexposed, but they're, they're two 74 gun ships. And this is a third 74 gun ship, a larger model force perspective. There's not that much distance in, in the real world. There's only about 20 inches between here and here. But the idea is that it makes it look like it's, um, you know, a thousand yards or more. Anyway, in the painting, uh, what we left off, I was talking a little bit about the horizon and where it was located and how strange it was that I was looking kind of down at some of the ships and then across at the one in the foreground. And I talked about a thing called the picture plane, which I think I've referenced once or twice before without explaining what a picture plane is. And for some of you, this is pretty obvious what a picture plane is. Plane as in like a flat featureless plane. The surface of the canvas is flat. And so and it's a picture. So this surface is the picture plane. And then you can almost imagine that projected onto it is the image. The image is flat. So it's really when you're talking about uh, composition, you're talking about framing things and deciding where the picture plane ends. And that is the edge of the canvas, right? That is the edge. You can't have a picture plane beyond this in this painting, even though it exists in the real world. Like, you know, the second half of this frigate in the foreground exists off the picture plane. It's not on the picture plane. And um, the cheap and easy way to handle a picture plane is to like cut a hole in a piece of cardboard and then you can come up with a picture plane of your own. You can move the cardboard around and you can create a composition that way, right? You're looking through the cardboard. Let's say I just want to show the ship in the bottle and the golden figure, but not all of it. You'll have to make these artistic decisions where on the picture plane you're going to place the objects. It's really but like moving around. So I did this drawing showing a guy holding up a, a, a picture frame, right? But he's the little red dots represent the limits of what his eye sees, right? Like laser beam. So he can only see the front half. The blue thing is that corresponds with the frigate in the foreground in my painting. So then there's also these rolling waves. And these other dots represent the other ships, right? So this reddish one is that uh, 74 that's in the middle distance. And then these two yellow ones are the smaller, smaller ships that are farther away. So. Here's a drawing showing the guy's eyeball, which is right here. We don't know what's behind him, right? Um, the picture plane would be this dotted line, and he's looking into it, right? So he sees across the, the lower part of the frigate. He doesn't see the upper part. And then he sees in the distance these, these other ships. And there's a wave peak here and a wave peak here. And these ships are on the interface of this. So let's go back to this again. This is that middle distance ship. And I just now started laying in this little bit of a lighter tone, separating the water here from the water here. So I want to have this stacked perspective where there's objects way in the foreground. And then there's another layer back behind that. And then there's another layer back behind that, right? And another one of those um, talking about composition conventions is foreground, middle ground, background. And that I think is self-explanatory. The foreground's up front, the middle ground is uh, less uh, defined, but everybody understands it's somewhere in the middle, the middle ground, and the background, which is obviously in the back, right? So uh, how you arrange the objects, again, on the picture plane, determines where the, how you are defining the space inside the painting. And we'll pause as the fire trucks go by outside. Woo! So I drew the picture plane again, right? That's the picture plane. And that's the square represents the picture plane, right? So I want you to look at this. That's the horizon, right? And if I put the picture plane here, the horizon is up pretty high, right? And I can lower the horizon within the picture plane. 
and it's a different experience. Like now, these waves somehow appear closer to you, right? I lowered the horizon down. And in this case, the horizon isn't straight. Usually it's straight. But what I'm doing in this painting is I'm going to have layers, right? So there's the, the far distance, which in this painting is up pretty high, right? It's, it's, it's here, but it actually might wind up before we're done being way up here, where you're looking almost to the visual horizon. At sea, you can see like, I think, 19 miles or something like that, unless you get up higher. Maybe it's 17 miles. Somebody write in and correct me on a clear day. Um, so that would be 17 miles away, let's say. So there's another wave that comes in in front of that one, right? And this is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about stacking up these layers. I made them two different colors so they're distinctly different from each other and they read differently to the eye. If I made them the same color, they'd be dissatisfying. The eye wouldn't be convinced. So on the second layer, I'm going to place those two smaller ships, right? There they are. The two smaller ships are these ones. And then those that's corresponding to these ones way in the distance, OK? So let me lift off the picture plane again and add another layer. Here's another layer. Onto this layer, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to place the other ships. So this, this greener one here is representing this wave, right? Or swell, or whatever it is. They're cartoonishly exaggerated here. So that would go here. And let's throw in another layer just so we can say that that's, you know, floating in the water. So when I put the frame back on, our picture plane, it's now like this, and it's stacked up. And it's going to be up to me as the painter to paint the water in the background in such a way that the eye is going to see the distinctions. And if I make one of these shapes lumpy layers uh, realistically distinct enough from the one behind it, the eye of the viewer is going to fill in the rest and say, oh yeah, that object's farther away than this object. And it, you can see that it's in, this object is in front of an object behind it, so that one must be behind that one. So to finish the illusion, got the, the ship itself. This is our frigate, right? The frigate's on there, and I put this on there. And then this should look a lot like what we're painting right now. All right, it's a little messy, but you get the you get the idea, right? Like, here, let me shift all these up a little bit so they'll fit on the picture plane. There we go. <laughs> all right, <laughs> maybe the final results are not as uh, <laughs> as pretty, but the idea is you're representing all this space, right? And you're forcing you're you're forcing the eye to believe that these are farther away because these are smaller and because they're stacked up behind these other things in the foreground. So it's foreground, middle ground, background, and everything has it. You know, if I'm looking out my window, there's a school across the street. Let's call that the background. Um, in the street itself, there's a parked car. Let's call that the middle ground. And then in the foreground is, is the, the objects on the shelf. Everybody understands that. That's pretty clear. Um, so if you stick them that way in the painting, people are going to be able to tell how far away things are. Since we know how big a car is, if I paint the car on the picture plane, let's get back to the picture plane, right? If I paint the car on the picture plane and these things in the foreground, um, you're going to understand that that car is uh, 100 yards away, whatever it is, 50 yards from me, from my eyeball. You might even understand that I'm looking down at it based on the perspective. And the point of all this is that uh, where you're placing it on the picture plane, how big it is, um, there's, there's like some parameters that have to all match up with reality, right? Like I can't make the smaller ship be the same as this ship and closer to the eye. It has to be further away. Otherwise, I'm breaking those rules. And if I follow all those rules, the eye is going to, the eye of the viewer, the person who's going to view the painting, is going to, not even consciously, is going to grasp right away and understand why those objects are farther away. You don't, you don't like the, the illusion is in part that I'm going to paint them and make them look realistic. But the other part of the illusion is that I placed them in the right place and I made them the right size on the picture plane. I think that's all I got for today, except to say that like the talking about the painting itself. Um, after I finished shooting uh, the last episode, I've added more details. So this is a, like another couple of hours later into the painting. 
And I did go down this rabbit hole where I started worrying about the reality of what the ship looked like. And I started looking at my drawing of the Euryalis, which you saw before, and then looking at uh, different frigates, like in this book here, trying to find, uh, like, is this right? If this is from here to here, is this distance, is this right that it's, like, the, the sail up here, is this high? And uh, how far out is the stem if this distance is this distance and, how you know, the distance between this and this? I'm trying to scale everything off the drawing and keep it realistic, and I realize it's not realistic. And it's because the model that I was basing it all on, the one in the other room, I never told you the story behind this model. I saved this model from a junk shop and then rebuilt it. So whoever built this model made decisions about putting the mast where they did and the stem where they did. And this is, ostensibly, this is the USS Constitution. But in reality, I'm not certain that the uh, the uh, gun ports, which are barely visible in this dim light, are really arrayed correctly. Um, for the purposes that I had in mind when I was building this model, I was more concerned with just like trying out experiments on how to do the sails and stuff like that. Yeah, so when I was working on the painting, I start, I, like I say, I called that a rabbit hole. And I'm using that word because it's a fruitless effort to try to worry about that too much when I have the rest of the painting to worry about. But on the other hand, if I don't worry about those issues now, they'll be locked into the painting forever later. There's many, many times in my career where I've rushed to get into a painting and I was, I just didn't have the patience to draw it properly. So let's say I'm drawing a row of trees and I wanted to just start painting. So I'm like, I'm just going to start painting without figuring out exactly how far apart the tree trunks were, you know? And it's a bad example to use because we're not looking at any trees here. There's some way over there, but you know, whatever. Um, later, when I'm in the middle of the painting and I've invested hours and hours, I might notice these weird discrepancies, kind of like the one where I'm talking about where you've got a problem with scale, where this is in the wrong spot. You'll discover later, if you rush, you'll discover the mistakes. So it's better to find the mistakes in the drawing than it is to discover the mistakes later on when you're relying on the drawing to be the foundation your painting is resting on. So there is some argument for being careful and worrying about these little details. But on the other hand, um, I remember my art school teachers telling me to paint the whole painting all at once to um, to get into the paint and start painting and keep the painting going the whole time. And it, like I think what they were driving that is like in, a, in some kind of weird perfect universe you could paint the painting all at once in one sitting and get it all perfect. And that, that admonition to paint it all at once was to tell you actually to not worry too much about individual details. Don't paint just this section of the painting and bring it to completion and then move on to this one. Because when you're looking at the painting, you'd have this weird imbalance where there's like super sharp focus and perfection here and everything itself. It was all, it was all smudged and, and inconsistently daubed, you know? Um, but you do have to draw first. Drawing is important. I would say that um, if somebody said to me, my kid wants to learn to be a painter, I would not say, great, let him paint. I would say, wait, teach him how to draw first. Because you've got to draw first. All these discussions about these layers and everything and where they fall exactly these have not been about how I painted these shapes the discussion has been about where exactly in relationship to each other are the shapes so like there's a border between here and here and there's a ratio about how much of this is showing on the whole picture plane um, those are drawing issues, not color issues. So in other words, you could have the same discussion with just a pencil and a paper drawing lines. Uh, the color of these isn't really part of the decision making when you're deciding how much sky you need to balance the foreground. Those are drawing issues. So yeah, that's um, we're coming up on 14 minutes now, so I've gone over the 10 minute mark. And I kind of talked about the picture plane and then it segued into this strong talk about how you have to draw. <laughs> so I don't know. I, I probably don't get an A for uh, uh, laying out what, what, what concepts I wanted to hit. It became kind of free association. And hopefully that's not going to hurt the process of you enjoying these, uh, these videos. I'm assuming you will. Uh, <laughs> maybe it's my ego, but I think I've got something to say and something to that a painter or aspiring painter or someone trying to understand how paintings get made, um, they should find it rewarding. I'll say for my part, um, I'm always talking in metaphors. A good metaphor for what I'm doing is uh, when you see a DVD 
in the old days before Netflix, you could also watch the special features on the DVD. So you could watch Gone with the Wind, and then you could also click on the special features and watch a separate little section, and you'd hear experts talking about the film, and their opinions and, and observations were recorded long after the, 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 the movie had been made. But you got this uh, inside baseball deep dive into some parts of the process that you might not have really considered very carefully while you watch the movie. The, the movie was just washing over you. And um, it's interesting to hear how the sausages get made. It's interesting to hear what was the underpinning that they, they based everything else on top of. And you can't see the underpinning anymore, but it informs your grasp and appreciation of the painting if you understand you know, the, the cleverness of these, these uh, weird almost like magic tricks or sleight of hand things, you know? So that's what I'm trying to do with these uh, discussions of the painting itself. I haven't talked at all about History of Trafalgar in this episode. This one has been uh, talking about composition still. But I'll get to Trafalgar in the next one, let's hope. And that's it for today. Thanks for watching.